from the development of a single point perspective in the 15th century, artists enjoyed creating a scientific model of how objects are seen by the light that they reflect. It occurred to some artists to model painting by analogy to the eye, where rays from a motif are concentrated through a lens to cast an image on a, ret on a retina. Already familiar with grids for enlarging their cartoons, some artists considered systematically measuring distances using a grid in front of the motif, provided that the position of the eye could be fixed by means of a spike. This engraving by Dürer is an example. I don't think that anyone actually painted that way. It's a horrible process <laughs> if you've ever tried it. I personally gave it a go with these milk crates of 2002, but with each one I only lasted a short spell before throwing the tackle away and concluding that no one who knows how to draw would ever submit to the indignity. Tools such as the grid and spark nevertheless had appeal to artists and theorists as a cipher, a symbol of a process and a way of explaining perspective. They make good didactic diagrams, lessons in the way that light is conceptualised as rays that the eye distinguishes according to their points of origin. The same is true of the camera obscura. Instead of the spike and grid, you can uh, project an image through a lens which appears upside down in a dark chamber. It's clumsy depending on blazing light outdoors and an owl's vision inside the chamber. It's useless for making a painting uh, where you'd apply colour over a field that has coloured light on it, but it's attractive for explaining visual processes by analogy. There's a beautiful link between perception and science, but it doesn't mean that optical tools had any use for artists in practice. Western art isn't optics based but drawing based. Using a perspective system or not, drawing means judging proportions and spatial relations with mixtures of perception and calculation, registering them on the plane and building up a three-dimensional motif. If you're really skilled at drawing from life, you can also have elements of a motif in your imagination, as when an angels fly in the clouds or figures dance, a dynamic iconography that fills European painting. Drawing is the technique that artists used since antiquity, capturing bodies in movement over 2,000 years before photography or its naive antecedents. If you can draw a hand, understanding the assembly of planes and curves, distinguishing volumetric shading and cast shadows, you won't need any device with lenses or mirrors to help you draw the lineaments of a room or a harpsichord, a wall with transitions or a Persian carpet. They're the easy bits. The tenacious desire to believe that the old masters used optics to create their masterpieces drives certain writers to theories as improbable as they are unnecessary, given that no feature of an old master has ever been identified that, can be that can't be explained as a standard part of drawing and painting. Vermeer is the fam favoured example, but even the dramatic tenebrist Caravaggio has been suspected of using mirrors and lenses. An example is Roberta Lapucci, who considers that works like the Bacchus were done with mirrors, which explains the unprecedented gesture of holding the cup in the left hand. That's weak evidence. Never mind that there are people who are left-handers and who don't mind which hand holds up a cup. Let's suppose that it really is a scandal that Bacchus is seen to be left-handed. If it's so irregular and the inversion is because uh, he used a mirror, Caravaggio could have instructed the model to hold the cup in the left hand so that in, the final result is that it appears in the right hand. If Caravaggio was so clever with optics that he could perform the impossible feat of painting a picture in the dark with a feeble reflection, surely he wasn't so stupid if it really meant so much iconographically to neglect to flip the model's hands for the shoot. It's about nothing. It's a performance. You can do whatever you whatever you can do. Use whichever hand you like, um, especially if you're Bacchus. The visual evidence for the use of optics among the old masters is at this level of rigor, proving nothing in all the claims about depth of field, sharpness, accuracy with shading, or geometric uh, theories about viewpoint. And I'm afraid that the documentary evidence is equally fragile. 
against overwhelming evidence that Renaissance and Baroque artists created their works with bedrock drawing skills that obviate the need for anything else, the evidence around optics is flimsy. The scholarship of pro-optics enthusiasts is so ragged that Francesco Algarotti is reassigned by Luti to the 17th century instead of the 18th century when he noted how Crespi suggested that the camera obscura should be used as a means for observing rather than as a tool for direct drawing. And like that quote, the tatters of evidence mustered in favour of optics in fact argued just as nicely against optics. The main snippet comes from Anton Maria Zanetti 1771, describing the 18th century Vedutista Canaletto. It's been translated as, he taught the correct way of using the camera ottica. The text refers to teaching, where the example of the camera is used. That's the same pedagogical purpose that the spike and grid served in Dürer's didactic image. It's about demonstrating visual principles to students. The text elaborates the content of these lessons, namely to know the defects that are usually wrought upon a picture when the maker entirely trusts the perspective seen in the camera and doesn't know how to remove it promptly when it offends the senses. Or this Zanetti goes on, makes you understand that the practical act of using the camera was not very simple and that the lenses and the rest introduced to facilitate painting had ended by requiring a certain level of skill. Implicitly then, uh, instead of saving work, the camera demands exorbitant levels of care to correct its errors. It's almost a statement of disappointment. What promised to be a benefit ended up a handicap. You can see what errors are meant in this wonderful example of a veduta by Canaletto and the same vista captured by a 35mm lens. The picture isn't mine, it's taken from a website promoting the view that the camera was used. What an impossible job to rectify all that bowing and lean once you've traced them in. Taken together with the visual evidence, Zanetti's text reveals that the camera ottica is not useful for painting. It's brought into Canaletto's class, not his practice, in order to demonstrate various theorems, confessing that paintings operate according to different principles than cameras. Canaletto owned a camera obscura. Why wouldn't he? The immense complication of a distant scene can be shown in astonishing detail when you look into the small dark box. Imagine the temptation of being able to capture all those tiny windows half a kilometre away when doing a veduta, if only the tracing had any pictorial value. In practice, Canaletto owned a camera obscura in the same way that Dürer built his grid and spike. Vermeer also had access to lenses. They testify to artists' scientific curiosity and they're also a great teacher's aid. Spikes, lenses and mirrors don't help make old master paintings and as far as I can see didn't contribute to studio practice even if artists occasionally tinkered with them, especially for teaching just how different painting is from optics. The old masters all knew how to draw and even when chromatically inflected, the great sensory way of understanding form remains the salient element of their pictorial magic.